William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. It's okay to cut a competitor down a few notches, but never cut him six feet lower than the soles of his feet. That's no longer fair competition, folks. That's murder. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. One way of landing a client is to fish him out of the river, which is exactly how I commenced my confidential file in a character named Richie Stimson. I jumped with my shoes on. I found Stimson's hat before I found Stimson. Nobody rescues a hat, so I didn't. When Stimson finally bobbed into reach, he promptly stuck one thumb in my eye and the remaining one in my juggler vein. Another thing nobody wants to do is drown in a stranger's embrace. When his jaw came up flush with the surface, I landed on it. He lay quietly on his back now, spouting water from the mouth like Moby Dick. And I began floating him to shore. On shore, the closest shelter we could find was a junk dealer's basement store. I stuck Moby Dick right up against the stove so he could dry out. Stand there till the icicles melt, Buster. Then I got my shoes off. Oh, squish. I'd been really walking in canal boats. Rescue a guy from drowning, you expect his first speech to be, thank you, but not this joker. My, my, my car... Hey, 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 what about my car? Oh, I'm keeping it as a souvenir of the occasion. Hey, it's a brand new job. The fish will be pleased to know. Lean close a minute, Buster. Lean? Yeah, that's close enough. I want to smell your breath. Hmm. I, I, I wasn't drunk going through that guardrail. Get that idea out of your head. Just lousy driving, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's coming back to me now. What is? That same feeling I've been getting lately. Dopey all of a sudden. And, and, and the blues, like I'm depressed. Up here, something starts fogging up. In your head? Yeah, yeah. Makes me want to shut my eyes, like I've been on a weekend toot, and now i got to sleep. And do you shut your eyes? Uh, I don't know. Buster. What? Confidentially. Who are you? Richie Stimson. A uh, chauffeur. Used to be. And now? A husband. That's, uh, uh, your occupation? Yeah, that is. Oh. Who are you? Barry Craig. I'm a detective. Ah, well, you know. And, uh, where can I bill you? Bill me for what? A suit of clothes, look. Oh, yeah, it's torn. Hey, uh, you sure it wasn't torn before? Now, that's what I call gratitude. 472 and one half Park Avenue. Send me the numbers and I'll write out a check. Where? Park Avenue? Man, what's the surprise? Boy, your kisser has got 10th Avenue on it. <laughs> so I moved east seven blocks. <laughs> so you married east seven blocks. I mailed Stimson my bill for suit of clothes and a new pair of shoes. And surprise of surprises, I got a prompt reply in the return mail. Addressee's name on it, Stimson, with the Park Avenue address. Well, there was a check in it, but not exactly for $100 I had politely requested. The check had an extra zero on it, $1,000. Check signed, Natalie Stimson. I read the short note that came with it. Dear Mr. Craig, small token of my gratitude for the wonderful thing you did for my husband. Signed, Mrs. Natalie Stimson. And there was a postscript. I would very much like to meet you at your convenience. A thousand bucks was the most elegant persuasion I knew. Yeah. 
Information? I'd like the phone number of a golden angel. Her name? Oh. This is Natalie Stimson, 472 and a half, Park Avenue. We met at a rendezvous at the ladies' insistence, not mine. An out-of-the-way private for members only joint called the Club Socrates, where people dined lying down on couches like the old Roman nobility. The maitre de hotel wore a toga, and the slant-eyed waitresses were all made up to resemble Cleopatra. Natalie tried to clear up my confusion. It's the revival of old Roman dining habits, Barry. It's the newest fad. Imagine. Mm, it restores eating to what it should be. And what's that? Oh, what? Well, Life's most gratifying experience. A sheerly exotic... Enough said. So, kick your shoes off, lie back on the couch, and luxuriate. Really enjoy it, Barry. So tell me. Can you? Why we're wallowing here. Oh. Oh, I want to talk to you about Lissy. Oh, your ex-chauffeur and present husband. It's his unaccountable depressions. You worry a little. Richie's told you about them? You sound surprised. Why, well, I am for Richie to confide so quickly. Well, I'm a guy people right away confide in. He says he gets, uh, quote, uh, dopey all of a sudden. Gets the boo. Becomes uh, depressed. And then up here in the beans, something starts fogging up, uh, unquote. His reflexes go awry. He loses sense and coordination. I've seen it happen time and again. Well, give me an example. What? Well, in entering my dad's brokerage office some weeks ago, Richie burst through the door but continued going across the room. He didn't stop at Dad's desk. And where did he continue on to? Right through the window. How far did he fall? Two stories. The miracle was he landed on a terrace on the 26th story. Otherwise, 28 floors to the sidewalk. Otherwise, a horrible day. What do you make of it? Well, I could go medical and call it an unconscious suicide wish. But I won't say it. Then what do you say? I say hand Richie over to a doctor. But he's been to doctors. The doctors in the plural? Well, six doctors this year. Well, what did the last chap say? That Richie's a normal neurotic. Yet he's accident prone. Accident prone. Those are exactly the words the other fellow, the, the lay analyst, used. So keep him under glass. Don't let him roam around. Now, is that practical advice? Maybe not. Now, besides sympathy, uh, what do you want of me? I want you to be Richie's man friend. Come again? You see, I've got my own theory about Richie. That being? That he's a cat in a strange alley. He needs someone around him to feel at home with, someone who talks his language. Same being a slob like me, huh? I'll pay a thousand dollars a week. For me to chum around with Richie? Room with him. Play gin rummy with him. Go off to ballet shows. All the things Richie used to enjoy doing. And for how long am I, uh, Damon, to his piteous? One month. One month for four thousand dollars. Sold. And you'll do it? For four grand, I'd swim underwater to Siam. <laughs> And that's how I came to move over to Park Avenue. But not without protest from my newfound buddy. Ah, uh, get your hat and scram out of here. If I do that, I'm unemployed. Hey, who's paying you? My father-in-law? I haven't met him yet. Natalie? Natalie. So, uh, Natalie hires you to watch over me, huh? <laughs> oh, you've got that wife in a million. Hey, uh, what's Natalie paying you? Oh, a mere thousand a week. Five hundred. What happened to my other five? I just cut in for it. You did? Yeah. I could use more dough. They're keeping me on short rations. And if I get stubborn about my whole thousand? We're not best friends no more. You run out of here like a thief. You're unemployed. Bum. Okay? Okay, partner. Uh, I'll give you a horse. You run your five back to a grand. Decent of you. <laughs> hey, what do we do today? Anybody for the zoo? Zoo, my eye. Hey, I know what. So do I. Oh, hey, you're not a mind reader. Your mind reads easy. The Crescent Burlesque House, over in Hoboken. <laughs> what do you know? You are a mind reader at that. <laughs> Ah, 
that was the chauffeur turned blue blood in one of his optimistic moods. I also got him in his pessimistic moods, and right on top of breakfast. Hey, the, the fox coming up, it's beating at my eyeballs. You're depressed today. I feel lousy. Boy, how lousy I feel. Hating the world and yourself? Yeah. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. Hey, will you look? I, I can't even tie my shoelaces. Hand shaking? Yeah, like that head mom over at the Crescent last night. The reflex is all shot, huh? Who knows about reflexes? Now, look, hold one arm out straight in front of you. Huh? Uh, okay. Now what? Close your eyes. So they're closed. Now bring a finger back and touch the tip of your nose. Touch the tip? Oh! oh. Trouble? I, I, I jabbed my finger in my eye. Couldn't find your own nose, huh? Hey, uh... What does that mean? Your coordination's off. Uh, way off? Way, way off. Hey, what, uh, what does it to me, huh? We ask a doctor. Well, I've been to doctors. I, I've been tapped with little hammers, x-rayed. I've been laying on couches and talking myself hoarse. Talking about what? Oh, anything that came in my head. Psychiatry, this was. Uh, about kid days, my old lady. The time Lefty Louie came out, we would have put your knife. Over broad, this was. And uh, uh, about Miss Curran. Miss Curran? Yeah, my my teacher, 4B. I used to dream about her a lot. I figured to marry her when I grew up. So why didn't you? Well, at the time I was in 4B, she was 72. Now, no, what I got in for doctors, I tried them. Hey, uh, what we do today, huh? We'll stay indoors and play gin. Leave us not tempt your reflexes. Richie had been to doctors, but I hadn't. So I tried one, an old friend. He'd room with my aunt once while serving his internship. Dr. Dinglespieler. A nice little guy who kept his beard buttoned in his vest. You, you say he has been to doctors? Six. He's run the gamut, from cardiography to psychoanalysis. Well, it is very strange that there was no recommended therapy. This ontology seems to be clear. Meaning? The disorientation. The damage to the nervous system. Uh, talk to me in English, not Greek. Uh, either the man has a detectable nervous disorder or he is in a psychosis. As simple as that. I mean, medically speaking. A good physician uh, should see what bothers Richie Stimson by eye. Uh, a head doctor could do it by ear. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely apple pie for a doctor to diagnose. Now look, apple pie is for the cook and the kitchen. Okay, then say easy to diagnose. There is perhaps one simple conclusion to come to. Uh, speaking for the doctors, I mean. And that is? Well, uh, that your friend had none of these symptoms you have described at precisely those times when the doctors examined him. Had none of the symptoms at the time of examination? Yeah. I'll need time to figure that one out, Doc. Now, uh, tell me, which branch of medicine is more apt to be mistaken? The nerve specialist can be sure. Meaning the head doctor has a bigger margin of error. Well, psychic sickness is a, is a more experimental medicine. It is, a, well, shall we say, in a stage of development. And Richie Stimson is in a stage of disintegration. Well, thanks for your time, Doc. If I said I wasn't twice as confused as when I came in, I'd be lying. Well, so long. I trotted myself over to 10th Avenue for a peek into Richie Stimson's background. A look into his case history, as the science books put it. I figured out a chat with his folks, if he had any, or his neighborhood priest. But I found a brother. The lettering on the window of the fish store read, uh, Waldo Stimson, Fresh Fish. I found Waldo in a bloody apron, chopping away at a sea monster that looked like a barracuda. Now, stop chopping, and let's talk about your brother, Richie. About uh, Richie, I got one word that ends a conversation. And the word? Snob. He's been high-hatting you? <laughs> Fox, that snazzy car is in front of my fish store and sits behind a wheel smoking a cigar. The louse just sits out there, rubbing it in. Rubbing what in? The butts. How he's got him, and I ain't. Oh, Answer a question or two for me, huh? Sure. 
Was Richie physically fit? Strong as a bull. You should have seen how he broke Toby Delahanty's jaw. Bang, one sock. Well, was he subject to headaches and accidents? Hmm? I don't get you. Did he ever fall over his own feet or fall down the stairs, walk into a plate glass window? Richie, not on your life, bub. Huh. Got him moving around, he was 200%. Champ basketball player and ice hockey. Why, the pros were hustling him to sign a contract. Then generally well-coordinated. Sharp eyesight and the rest of it? Sharp eyesight? <laughs> you saw the chicky grabbed off for himself. Yeah, upper-class Natalie. Well, tell me, uh, how do you figure he swung that? Well, you come to making out, Richie was a conniver. There wasn't a day he didn't have a scheme going for himself. Shady or uh, strictly legit? Uh, both ways, depending. Any way Richie could better himself, why, that was it. Hey, look, you're taking up my time. I got fish to sell. You got a three-pound Siberian herring? Siberian herring? Huh. What do you know? I'm fresh out of them. That led me to the father-in-law, C. Lindsay Bernard, broker. I wanted to know how come the uppercase Bernard had sanctioned his daughter's marriage to the family chauffeur. I found Bernard, senior, behind a mahogany desk the size of a tennis court. The cigar in his mouth almost reached out into the hall to the elevator. Yeah, sure. Question, Craig, has definite point, but uh, not with me. Well, why not? There, there's no snobbery in the veins of C. Lindsay Bernard. Not a drop of it, sir. We're a tribe of great commoners. Why, my father cleaned sewers, and his father sold pots and pans along the great American highway. Then you approved of Richie Stimson? Oh, heartily, sir. You might say I cheered him up that middle aisle to the marriage altar. I favored Richie over Byron Follins' bed. Yes, sir, a red-blooded young man like Richie. Why, I abetted his cause with Natalie. I am against the rich inbreeding with the rich. Very bad for progeny. Transmits white blood cells. Offsprings are anemic. Cut. My ears are bent. While we're on this high-level talk, uh, a quotation comes to my head. Uh, Something we used to recite in school, Mr. Bernard, uh, from Shakespeare. Oh, always a pleasure to hear Shakespeare quoted. The quotations, huh? Uh, Methinks you plead too hard. That is a sneer at my veracity? It could be. Why, you foul-mouthed, low-born peasant. And a minute ago, you were the guy advertising himself as the great commoner. From Bernard Senior's office, I drove back to Park Avenue to resume with Richie Stimson. We had big plans for the evening. A repeat of the night before the night before. The Crescent Burlesque over in Hoboken. At 472 and a half Park Avenue, I found Richie already downstairs on the street. On the sidewalk, a few feet away from the big front door canopy. Top hat on him and tails as if he couldn't wait to get going to Hoboken. Only thing, he was the last guy I'd want to be seen out with. Not the condition he was in. Flat on his back with a seepage of blood dyeing his clothes red. A crowd of morbid gapers packed around him and an ambulance on its way to the scene. No, sir, no date. I couldn't see myself watching a girly show with a corpse. One byproduct of death you can be absolutely sure of is a widow's tears. Richie. Oh, and Natalie sure wept, <laughs> tears cascading down her until the little chiffon item she was wearing clung to her like a bathing suit after a dip in the ocean. A show of grief and a bereaved father-in-law comes harder. Either it's unmanly to cry or C. Lindsay Bernard was a five-eighty capper in the art of self-control. The only thing that occurred to him to do was abuse me. Richie died because of your negligence, Craig. Your default of duty. You weren't hired to gad about making ridiculous inquiries. You had explicit duties. You were paid to stay with Richie. Never let him out of your sight. The guy is slated to walk off an outside terrace 18 stories up. Comes a time when he does it. There's only one chap really watching him 24 hours a day. One chap? The angel of death. A 
brother of the deceased can usually muster a tear or two. <laughs> Poor kid. Death softened you toward your brother Richie, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I, I ain't got no hard feelings now. Who she set up like this here? Look at them drapes and that chandelier. Imagine walking out on it. Walking off a terrace into space 18 stories over the sidewalk. Yeah. What a way to go. Your beautifully coordinated brother. The kid with sharp eyesight and trained reflexes. Oh, oh, about that. Uh, no, um, I didn't exactly feature the right dope on Richie. That, that time we talked, I... Well, I sort of left something out. You did? Yeah, you know, something that came back to mind. You see, Richie was a big one for accidents. All the time falling down cellars or fire escapes... And, and your pains here, here in the head, always with a, with a wet towel and the ice pack on his bean. You get me, huh? Better than you think, Waldo. Tell me something. What? Who's paying you to lie to me and how much are you getting? Well, suppose I am in the way of a few bucks. No harm to nobody. Why should I pass it up? Because your brother was set up to accidentally kill himself. I'll be murdered. M- Heard it. Now, how could that be? Say a push off that terrace. But you don't know that. No, I don't. But pushed or fell. Either way, it's murder. But he'd been dopey all the time, tripping over his own feet. You yourself told me that. Yeah, dopey and so forth. And I've got an explanation for that. What? Drugs. Somebody's been feeding Richie drugs in his drink and in his food. Drugs that work havoc on his reflexes for a time, then dissipate into the bloodstream. So that he seems okay during medical examinations. Yeah, but who, who, who'd be feeding him drugs? Who offered you a bribe to suddenly remember that Richie was accident prone? Two of them did. Natalie and her old man. <laughs> I only got a piece of the truth from Natalie. I didn't marry Richie. He married me. What was the blackmail threat that got you to say yes? As my father chauffeur, he... he... Got something on your father? Some business irregularity your father could be liable to prosecution for? Is that it? Okay. Clam up pending advice of counsel. I'm content to let the whole story wait on the autopsy. The, the autopsy? The one I'm ordering to be done immediately. To determine the nature of the drug that got Richie drowsy and dopey enough to walk off that terrace into cold space. This one hasn't had time yet to really dissipate into the bloodstream, beautiful. I was insane. Never hire you. People are all the time hiring me as a cover for their cute operations. I can be hired, baby, but not bought. Hired, but not bought. I'm sure you understand the difference. You've been to college. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Angel of Death, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of the man who died by himself, about which Barry Craig has this to say. We call next week's story The Man Who Died By Himself. Among other things and corpses, it deals with a fortune teller, a fortune, and a beautiful girl. And, of course, the man who died by himself, except he wasn't entirely alone. He had a killer for company. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Directed by Arthur Jacobson. Cast included Paul Duboff, Betty Lou Gerson, Jack Carroll, and Jack Moyles. This is John Lang speaking. Join Groucho Marx for You Bet Your Life tonight on the NBC Radio Network.